Good morning, everyone. We're going to continue along in the practice final packet. I don't think I'm going to get the whole way through the packet, but I have from past semesters like a video I can post after class for any of the problems that we don't get through in today's packet. But let's uh, continue here with this problem here. I think this is on page 11 of the packet. We know a compound has a formula XO3, where X is an unknown element. If the compound 60% O by mass, what is the formula of the compound? This problem here, I think, is just wanting us to use that the percent O in this compound would be equal to three times the atomic weight of oxygen from the periodic table, 16.00 AMU. And that divided by the formula weight of the compound times 100% would be equal to the 60%. And so let's get rid of the percent. So let's get rid of the times 100 and let's change this to 0 0.600. And so 3 times 16 divided by the formula weight is equal to 0 0.6. So I can solve for the formula weight of the compound. And then once I have the formula weight of the compound, I can either see which compound has that formula weight or I could subtract 3 times 16 for the O's and get the X component's mass. And so if I take... 3 times 16, and then I divide by 0. 0.6, and then multiply the formula weight of the compound over to here. So cross multiply by the formula weight of the compound, divide by 0. 0.600. So 3 times 16, divide by 0. 0.6 is equal to 80.0. So the formula weight of the compound is 80.0 AMU or grams per mole. And that contains three times the, the mass of oxygen. So this would be equal to three times 16.00 and then plus whatever the mass of X is. And so I could subtract, you know, 80 minus three times 16. That gives me 32. So I could take 80.0 minus three times 16.00. This gives me 32.00 AMU as the mass of X. So if the X and the three O's are 80, then the molar mass of X is 32, and sulfur has a molar mass of 32. And so this molar mass would be consistent with the formula of SO3. A double check would be if SO3's formula weight is 32.0 plus 16 times three, of course that's 80, just do 16 times three, divide by 80, that's 0.6. So that's the 60% uh, by mass oxygen. So question 11 is just using what a percent by mass is of a given element. The next question is getting at, well, getting a formula from percent composition. We maybe could have taken a similar approach for 11 as we might for 12. For 12, we're given the percent by mass carbon and hydrogen. We're also given a uh, molecular weight of the compound. There's probably still a few ways I can solve 12, but fundamentally the way we've approached these problems is from this data here, from the percent by mass data, let's get an empirical formula. And then let's figure out how many units of the empirical formula there are using the molecular weight in like step two. So step one would be, let's try to determine the empirical formula. So I can take 87.7 grams of carbon that's present in ratio to 12.3 grams of hydrogen. And what I need to do here is start with just a ratio of the masses of the elements. The easiest way to do that is just to take the percentages as masses because we know if it's 87.7 grams of carbon, 12.3 grams of hydrogen, that's 87.7% carbon, 12.3% hydrogen. So I just need to use their atomic weights, 12.01 grams per mole of carbon, and then 1.008 grams per mole of hydrogen. And then this will tell me specifically the number of moles in that 100 gram sample, this uh, sample we're starting with here. But hopefully we can then try to get to some whole number ratios from these mole values. So I go 87.7 divided by 12.01. I get 7.30 moles of carbon present in ratio to 12.3 divided by 1.008. That's 12.2 moles of hydrogen. So now we obviously can't round to C7H12. These aren't close enough to round. So what I need to do is try to find, well, what's the ratio of carbon to hydrogen? One way to do that is just to identify which one's smallest is 7.30. Divide both of these by that number. We have to keep the ratio intact so I can't divide 
one by one number and a number another by a different. I had to divide both of these by the exact same number to keep the ratio intact. This gives me one mole of carbon present in ratio to 12.2 divided by 7.30 is 1.67. Let me erase. Okay, so again, not whole numbers, but we're getting there. So the next question would be, do we need to multiply by two or three or four? It has to take a whole number multiple at this point. It can't be a fraction. If I take a fraction times one, it's going to be a fraction. I have to get whole numbers for both values. So I just think if, if they're not whole numbers, I just double, triple, and I'm looking for the first time I get a whole number, I get a whole number with three. And so if I multiply these both by three, I'd have three moles of carbon in ratio to 1.67 times three, which would be five, to five moles of hydrogen. So my empirical formula would be C3H5, the simplest ratio of carbon to hydrogen, C3H5 for this compound. So this is our empirical formula, which for a molecular compound, a CH compound is molecular, not ionic. For a molecular compound, we probably want to know the molecular formula more often than the empirical formula. So then we're given the molecular weight here so that what we can do is calculate the empirical formula weight So the formula weight of the empirical formula will be 12.01 times 3 plus 1.008 times 5. That's 41.07. Call it 41.1 AMU. So that's just the mass of three carbons, five hydrogens added together. And so let's take that empirical formula weight and divide it into the molecular weight. And that's going to come out to 4. So 164.3 divided by 41.1. This gives me a value of 4. So there's 4 units of the empirical formula in the molecular formula. So C3H5, which I have to multiply both of those sets of coefficients by 4. You have to keep that ratio intact, of course. So that gives me C12H20. Now, once we get C12H20, you can double check that it gives you the right molecular weight. You can double check that it gives you this, the correct percent by carbon, the percent by hydrogen by mass, if you really wanted to uh, do like a double check at the end. But the key would be kind of two steps usually in these problems. Find the empirical formula, find the molecular formula. Now, you may have been sitting there saying, well, why, why don't I take this formula here and multiply it by the percent by mass, you could find other ways to solve this problem. But I think categorically the way we tend to think of these problems is you can get experimental data to get the percent composition through uh, an, an elemental composition experiment. Um, so the, these pieces of information can be furnished from like one type of experiment, then the molecular weight from a second type of an experiment. Okay, let's get into um, a stoichiometry problem. So we have a reaction here. We're asked which reactant is limiting when I have the same masses of these two reactants reacting together, how much excess reactant remains as well as also being asked. So in these problems here, we also have a variety of ways we can think of solving these problems. Anytime I have a limiting reactant problem, we could just pick a product, see how much product you can make from one reactant, see how much product you can make from the second reactant, which one's lesser is the limiting reactant. That would be one way to go about this problem. A second approach, and probably a faster one for this problem, would be let's pick one of the reactants um, and see how much of it would react with the other. So let's maybe ask this question. How many grams of water are required to react with the 22.5 grams of calcium carbide that are given CAC2? And so um, CAC2 would be 40.08 plus 12.01 times 2. So that's 64.1 grams per mole. And I have to do the mole-to-mole -mole conversion for every one mole of calcium carbide that reacts according to this reaction. We have to react two moles of water with it. And then the molar mass of one mole of water is 18.02 grams. So if we react this full quantity, we need 
12.6 grams of water to react with this quantity of calcium carbide. So this is the quantity of water that reacts when this quantity of calcium carbide reacts. We're losing two moles of water for every one mole of calcium carbide. Now, we could set up a BCA chart too. That's probably your guys' not entirely favorite way to solve the problem. Not mine either. My favorite way to solve the problem is the fastest way, right? And this is probably the fastest way. Just pick one of the reactants, see how much of it's needed to react with the other. If I picked wrong here, I would just have to flip the problem. If, 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 if I needed more water than what I had available in the reaction, then I would simply just have to flip the problem and use the other reactant, how much of it's required to react with the other. And so through, in this case, one dimensional analysis step, I get how much water reacts. I get that calcium um, carbide is the limiting reactant. It's the one that's totally consumed. Water is the one that's left over. Water is the excess reactant. And I can see it's the excess reactant because I have 22.5 grams initially present. And then I can subtract the 12.6 grams that reacts. And then that difference is probably 9.9 .9 grams. Yep. So I have 9.9 .9 grams of water remaining after this reaction completes. So uh, weird question in terms of the, the wording because it's asking which, limit, which reactant is limiting. So the limiting reactant is calcium carbide and then 9.9 .9 grams of water remain. So in terms of which actual answer is the correct one. So whenever we have stoichiometry, if we could somehow just find a, a way to solve the problem is good. If we can find the fastest way to solve the problem, that's great. Um, if we can think of more than one way to solve the problem, that's fantastic as well, because then we have options. Like if for some reason you didn't think of this way to solve the problem, just solve it any way you know how to identify the limiting reactant and then try to figure out how much water reacts and remains from there. Okay, so some chapter four questions here. So we have two and a half moles of calcium chlorate dissolving in water. My old equation chart used to have like chlorates and nitrates as water soluble with no exception, kind of like um, um, acetates. So this example here, we would, if we saw this question on our test, it would probably just say calcium nitrate or calcium acetate. Chlorates like those compounds are always soluble without exception. And so when this compound's dissolved in water, we kind of know it's dissolving in water from the nature of the question. We're told when two and a half moles of it dissolves in water, how many moles of ions form? Well, all of these polyatomic ions that we learned how to name, like chlorate, nitrate, acetate, all those ions remain intact. So we're gonna get calcium two plus uh, form as the cation. And then we're gonna have the chlorate ion form as ClO3 minus. We're gonna get two of them, of course, because of the two chlorates per mole of calcium nitrate. So I get two mole, or three total moles of ions per one mole of calcium chlorate that dissolves in water. So two and a half moles of this compound dissolves in water. I get seven and a half moles of ions. And so then when we start thinking of the electrolytic nature of the solution, the more ions I get into a solution, the more electrolytic. So if I'm comparing a solution that has a compound like this in it, it's gonna be very electrolytic. If I compare this with a solution of say HClO2, which is a weak acid, there's a bunch of weak acids like HClO2, HNO2, HF's a weak acid, not like the other hydrohalic acids. So HF's a weak acid. You put these compounds into water, you're not even getting two moles of ions per mole of compounds. So a very small amount of ionization for our weak acids. If you dissolve a strong acid like HCl, HNO3, these are strong acids. So you're getting now two moles of ions per mole of those compounds into water. And so if you put two and a half moles of HCl into water, you would get five moles of ions in solution, not as electrolytic as this calcium chlorate solution. If you dissolve two and a half moles of HF in water, you're not going to get anywhere near the electrolytic nature that the HCl solution has because you're getting fewer than two moles of ions. So you're getting mostly HF and just a small formation of H plus and F minus ions. Okay, we might see some other questions that get at 
the electrolytic nature of solutions, but I just wanted to kind of talk about the difference between ionic compounds. If you know, a compound's ionic, metal, non-metal ions, it ionizes in water if it dissolves. If it doesn't dissolve, we're checking our solubility chart if we need to check. But if it doesn't dissolve, it's insoluble. No ions end up in solution. And then if it's a molecular compound, the question is, is it an acid? If so, is it strong or weak? Strong totally dissociates, weak partially dissociates. We also have a weak base in NH3. Okay, let's move on to which compounds partially ionize in water, kind of probably getting at what this question's getting at. This is our weak base, our prototype weak base. Probably just really one example we would give of a weak base is NH3. There's a bunch of organic amines that we would call them once you see OCHEM, but I think you kind of need to see OCHEM a little bit to really understand other derivatives that are weak bases. So NH3 is really like the one compound that we really want you to recognize as being a weak base. That means it partially reacts with water not fully, but just partially to form ammonium cation and hydroxide ion. So you get some formation of hydroxide, just not a 100% formation in this reaction. This reaction takes place to about 5%. Um, so NH3 is a weak base. It partially ionizes in water. So we can say NH3 partially ionizes. We have a weak acid and acetic acid. It partially ionizes in water to acetate NH+, plus, just not totally, because it's not a strong acid. So both A and B here partially ionize in water. And so another way of saying partial ionization is they're weak electrolytes. So these compounds are weak electrolytes, the things that partially ionize in water, these are weak electrolytes. Now, if you see metal, non-metal, I don't know why magnesium hydroxide gets everybody. I don't know if maybe high school teaches this and we have memories of it or something, but MgOH2, if we see this on the test and we're asked, is this a weak electrolyte? It's, it's not dissolving in water. This, according to our solubility chart, is insoluble. So we would only give an electrolytic property term to something that dissolves in water. So this would not be applicable to discuss its, if it's a weak acid or base or a weak electrolyte. We would just say it's insoluble. Don't worry about classifying it as any type of electrolyte or any type of acid or base. Now, what about alcohol? Sometimes we get a little confused. Sometimes we get used to seeing the like hydroxyl group, that OH, and thinking, okay, things that release that are bases, so this has to be a base, but it's not. It does, that, that hydroxide doesn't fall off as an ion off of ethanol. Ethanol is not an ionic compound, so we're not going to get ionization. Ethanol is also not an acid. If it was, we probably would have named it something, something acid, and we didn't name it that way. This is just ethanol. And so one of the, the, the things that I think we, we, or one of the reasons I think we name a bunch of compounds is in chapter two is to get a framework of what some different classifications of compounds are so that we can you know, appreciate that things that we call acids are acids and things that we don't call acids aren't acids. And sometimes it gets confusing. Like maybe you would have thought this is an acid and we just didn't name it as such. No, it's, the, it's not going to have H plus fall off of it in water. It's not going to have hydroxide ion fall off of it in water. It's a simple non-electrolyte. So compounds that dissolve in water, or mix with water in this case, liquids here, ethanol, I think we know it mixes with water, um, that the term here is going to be non-electrolyte for the, the, the fact that this substance is not ionizing to any uh, appreciable extent. So non-electrolyte, non-acid or base here. And so then you might just go back and think, okay, well, what are the molecular compound examples that are some sort of an electrolyte? And it is really just the acids. So we have the weak acids or weak electrolytes. We have the strong acids or strong electrolytes. And then just that one weak base, NH3, is a weak electrolyte. Then if you see any other formula that you know is dissolving in water, like glucose, sucrose, um, other alcohols, that those compounds would be non-electrolytes. Uh, another, uh, oh, so the um, a chapter five question on heat here. So we have 4.75 grams of magnesium reacting with oxygen according to this reaction. Um, so then we're needing to determine if heat is released or absorbed. To determine that, I'm looking right at the sign of delta H. So my eyes go right to the sign of delta H. Delta H less than zero negative is exothermic. That means heat is released by the reaction. So heat's released by the reaction to the surroundings. So the surroundings would get hotter here. So if this is occurring in like a water bath, the water bath's gonna go up in temperature uh, because of our exothermic reaction taking place. And so the reaction is releasing energy. If delta H were greater than zero, then that would be endothermic, and that would be the example of a reaction that's absorbing heat as it takes place. 
And so when 4.75 grams of magnesium reacts, the heat change, what I might calculate here is my Q reaction. When I go to calculate Q reaction, I'm going to just kind of keep the sign on delta H, and then I'll reinterpret the sign after the problem. What I'm kind of thinking here is I'm going to go 4.75 grams of magnesium. I'm going to need to convert to moles of magnesium. It's 24.3 grams per mole. And then my Q reaction is minus 1204 kJs, but the per is per two moles of magnesium. And that two might be the most important number in the step, is it's relating that that's the heat when two moles of magnesium react. You might remember, if you double the coefficients, if you double the magnitude of all the coefficients, what happens to delta H? You double its magnitude. So think if we had four MGs plus 202 goes to four MGO. The delta H would have been minus 2408, but minus 2408 per four moles. So the 2408 per four is equal to the 1204 per two. So the ratio here is what we have to keep intact. So minus 1204 kilojoules per two moles of magnesium. And so, and again, I'm keeping this sign here. I'll reinterpret the sign after I do the math. So 4.75 divided by 24.3 times negative 1204 divide by 2, I get negative 118. Now if you notice all the choices are positive, all the choices are positive here because the reaction is losing 118 kilojoules. And so where is it losing it to? It's losing it through the releasing of that heat to the surroundings. So we would say 118 kilojoules is released by the reaction to the surroundings. So we have 118 kilojoules of heat is released. answer D. Okay, so we, like heat's easy, easier to track or easy to talk about when you're talking like the to to from. And so instead of, we could have asked for Q reaction, which, which case would have been minus 118, but I think it's just a weird way to ask the question. We're usually trying to figure out where did the heat come from, where did it go. Here the heat came from the reaction to the surroundings, 118 kilojoules was released to the surroundings. So a similar question below. Um, where we have a reaction ammonium nitrate dissolving in water. Um, here, my eyes go to the delta H is positive, so this is an endothermic reaction, so heat's being absorbed when this reaction takes place. And so when this reaction's occurring in water, we're putting ammonium nitrate into water, and the ionization is then taking place to form the aqueous ions. What happens to the solution temperature? And I can tell you, a lot of people think the solution temperature goes up because delta H is up. The delta H is positive, but that's not right. It's the, re the reactants are absorbing the heat, so the heat of the solution is dropping. And so heat was absorbed from the solution, or heat absorbed by the reaction from the surroundings, and the surroundings is the solution. So heat's being absorbed by the reaction from the solution. So the solution temperature should drop because the reactants absorbed some of its heat. The reactants absorbed the heat so they could turn into the products. So now a calorimetry style question on this topic where, well, let's try to, um, well, we're given the, the um, delta H here like we were in the previous example, but here we have three and a half grams of ammonium nitrate um, being added to and dissolving in 125 grams of water inside of a coffee cup. 25.0 degrees is the initial temperature. What is the final temperature of the solution where we're given that delta H, the same one we saw on the previous page? We're also given the specific heat of the solution. And the assumption that the calorimeter has a negl negligible heat capacity means it's not absorbing any of the heat or it's not contributing to the heat. All the heat that's going to the reaction is coming from the water and the solution that the reaction's uh, taking place in. And so the idea here would be the delta H of the reaction is um, like we can use that to, to try to solve for the Q reaction, the heat change that this reaction undergoes. So let me try to solve my Q reaction here. That's just simply trying to account for the three and a half grams of ammonium nitrate. Let's convert that to moles or given the molar mass. And then we're given that the heat of the solution is plus 25.7 kJs per mole of ammonium nitrate. 
So my moles of ammonium nitrate cancel, the grams cancel. So 3.5 divided by 80.05 times 25.7 gives me 1.12, call it 1.123. Kilojoules. So this is the amount of heat that specifically three and a half grams of ammonium nitrate has to absorb in order for the reaction to occur. And so then I can relate this Q reaction to the MCS delta T of the solution. And in fact, let me take a step back from here. Let's relate this to the negative the heat of the solution because the heat change of the reaction is the opposite of the solution. The heat absorbed by the reaction is being absorbed from the solution. So the reaction's heat's going up. The solution's losing its heat as a result. So we need that negative sign there. And then the solution's being described by that MCS delta T, the mass solution, CS solution, delta T solution. So I end up with the negative MCS delta T. So I almost missed my negative sign. But I just want to think how we have this negative relationship between the surroundings and the reaction. And that's where I get this minus sign from. And so then, and we also now know that this is equal to uh, 1,123 uh, joules. So let me convert this to joules here. So 1kj, 1,000 joules. The reason why I would do this is because the next step has the specific heat in units joules per mole Kelvin. And so we'll have this equal to plus 1,123 joules because that was the Q reaction that we calculated. Now, I think the two primary ways we can think through these problems, we can give you the delta H like we did here and ask you to solve for something relating to the delta T, or we've done this before where we give you the delta T and then you solve for the Q reaction and then you try to get the delta H afterwards. And so there's kind of like two steps to these processes, if you remember, either the relating the Q reaction to the negative Q solution to the MCS delta T. Sometimes that's the first step that we've done in the problem, but that's where we weren't given the delta H. And then the second step would be determining delta H from the quantity of reaction that took place. Here, I started with the quantity of reaction that took place because I was given the delta H, so I could work out Q reaction, and then I can set up my negative MCS delta T to solve for my delta T. And so my delta T is going to be equal to the um, negative 1,123 joules. So I'm just dividing by negative MCS delta T. So I just need to divide by the mass of the solution and the CS of the solution. So the mass of the solution is the 125 grams of water plus the 3.5 grams of reactant. So the mass of the solution is 128.5 grams. So we need to use the mass of the entire solution here. So that's why we're using the solution mass, the mass of the water and the reactant. And then my CS is 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin. And so my joules cancel, my gram cancels, and then this gives me my delta T in Kelvin. So a negative 1123 divided by 128.5 divide by 4.184 and I get my delta T is negative 2.09. Now the answer is not 2.09. This is how much the temperature drops. So this is the delta T goes down by 2.09 degrees and so my this is equal to my T final minus my T initial and so my T final will be equal to negative 2.09 plus the initial temperature of 25.0 degrees C. And that gives me 22.9 degrees C is my final temperature. So I'm just adding 25.0 and then the 2 .0, negative 2.09 Kelvin is equal to negative 2.09 degrees C. The delta T, the difference in temperature in Kelvin is the same as degrees C. So my difference in temperature of negative 2.09 Kelvin is equal to negative 2.09 degrees C. So another issue in these problems is dealing with the temperature conversion. Think of a 
difference in temperature of 25 to 26 degrees C, or in this case, 25 to 23 degrees C, that's a negative 2 degrees C difference in temperature. If we convert to Kelvin, it's 298 minus 296, 2 Kelvin difference in temperature. So be careful not to double convert into Kelvin here. Like if we converted this to negative, you know, 275 degrees C or something, that would not be the right way to solve this problem. So we're just taking this negative 2.09 degrees C and then adding 25.0 to that to get 22.9 degrees C is my final temperature. So now looking at the choices though, we could roll out A because the temperature should drop. This is an endothermic reaction. We know the temperature has to drop. We can also roll out 27.1. Again, the temperature has to drop here from the initial temperature. So the only reasonable uh, choices here were C and D. C is then the right answer. All right, so let's get into some like chapter six stuff. So how many orbitals? Um, are there in a 5p subshell? So the 5p subshell, what that refers to is when n is equal to 5 and l is equal to 1, because when we have a 1, that's our p shape. So our, the n equals uh, 5, l equals 1, has a possibi uh, possibility of having m sub l of minus 1, 0, plus 1. So that's our three orbitals. And then our m sub s for each of those could be equal to plus or minus 1, one half. And so we can have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. So I can have a total of six electrons in the subshell, and I can have those three orbitals that those six electrons can distribute into. So I have three orbitals within any of the P subshells. So the five P subshell, just like any of them, three orbitals, um, six electrons maximally can go into that subshell. Uh, an orbital that has an n of 4 and m sub l of minus 2, what are the range of possi possible angular momentum quantum numbers l for this orbital? And so when n is equal to 4, then the range of l will be 0, 1, 2, and then all the way up to 3. Can't have 4 because the l of 4, the l max is n minus 1. And so we can't have a value of 4, so the highest l can be is 3. If I have an l of 0 or 1, then I could not have an m sub l minus 2. So the m sub l range is from minus l to plus l. And so I can't have an l of 0 or 1 because they could not have an m sub l of minus 2. So when I have an n of 4, an m sub l of minus 2, then the l value could be 2 or 3. So this could be referring to an electron or an orbital in the um, 4d subshell or the 4f subshell. So the 4d or 4f orbital could have the m sub l of minus 2, and so the l value could be 2 or 3. And so just remember the l is telling you the shape, so 0 is the s, 1 is the p, 2 is the d shape, and 3 is the f shape. And then the that's telling you how many nodes you have like through... Like it's telling you how many like planar nodes you have through the axis of the atom. And so zero for S, one for P, so you have the P shape, two for the D orbitals, and then three for the F. So you just have like three sets of lobes for the F, two sets of lobes for the D, one set of lobes for the P, no lobes at all for the S. Chromium has one of those anomalies, the anomalous configuration of 4s1, 3d5. We would have expected 4s2, 3d4, so we're not creating or destroying electrons, we're just changing the configuration. So we would have expected a 4s2, 3d4. We don't have to have this memorized either, of course. Um, and the ones that do have anomalies are kind of hard to predict anyways. But so it really has the 4s1, 3d5 configuration. So for thinking of unpaired electrons, we're just then picturing having a 4s1 and then a 3d5 where we put one electron into each of those orbitals to maximize their spin according to Hund's rule. So I end up with all six of those electrons in chromium being spin unpaired. And so the unpaired electron count would be six. My valence count would also be six. From either two of these configurations, we predict the valence electrons would be equal to six. Remember, we take the outermost shell, and then if we have an unfilled subshell, we count those two. So we'd have six valence electrons for this atom. Once we get to like zinc and we have a 3D10, so zinc's configuration is a 4S2, 3D10. Of course, it's all the way across the transition metal block. Then we just say that this has two valence electrons. So this would be a different question. For zinc, two valence electrons, all the electrons are spin paired for that atom. 
effective nuclear charge trends. So um, if we're thinking of our periodic trends, the effective charge, this is the main one that increases from left to right. So we get the increasing effective charge as we go from left to right across the periodic table. And as we go from top to bottom, if we think of the effective nuclear charge, well, let's think left to right real quick. Left to right, the issue is we have the same core electrons. The core electrons are primarily the only electrons that shield nuclear charge. So we have an increase in valence electrons from left to right. So we therefore have the increase in effective charge. You have atoms on the left side that have low ionization energies. That leads to elements on the right side that have high ionization energies. Um, as a result of that effective charge trend. Also, the size trend coincides. You go from big on the left to small on the right, so we decrease in size as we go from left to right. And so, um, and then if we think top to bottom, the issue here is when you have a relatively small orbital, um, like imagine like hydrogen or helium, they're experiencing the full nuclear charge. And once you get to like lithium, you have this small probability of that electron being closer to the nucleus, so you get a little bit of a higher effective charge than you would have expected. When you get to sodium, you have even more probability of finding the electron relatively close to the nucleus. So as you go down in size, it's kind of all those like little probabilities becoming additive for the electron being relatively close to the nucleus that say from top to bottom that the trend is you get a slight increase in effective nuclear charge from top to bottom. And so when you're looking for the highest effective nuclear charge, it would actually be something like iodine. So if you go to the far bottom of the periodic table, this is going to be atoms, or if you even go to the noble gas column too. So the, the atoms on the far right side, xenon, iodine, even if you go radioactive, those elements below it would have a higher effective nuclear charge. And then if you go to the low effective nuclear charge would be like the hydrogen lithium side of the periodic table. Okay, so the atom with the greatest effective nuclear charge here is going to be iodine because we're comparing, you know, fluorine to iodine. So iodine's greater. We're comparing some alkali metals. Those are relatively low. The lowest possible effective nuclear charges are the alkali group and silicon somewhere in the middle. So iodine would have the highest effective charge. Largest radius now is going to be like on the cesium side. So um, if you think of elements on the far left side, but on the bottom of the periodic table, our size is decreasing left to right. So we have the greatest size on the left side of the periodic table, and then obviously size increases from top to bottom. And so if we're looking for the largest atomic radius, we're looking for, if we're reconstructing here, lithium, sodium, uh, sulfur, chlorine, and nitrogen, that sodium of these choices, of course, is going to be the biggest. So we're the furthest down, size decreasing left to right from there. Um, we probably couldn't answer the question smallest. Nitrogen's probably the smallest, but tricky question if we were asked the smallest here. So largest sodium, smallest probably nitrogen, probably the things in the second row are going to be smaller on average than all the things in the third row, but tricky question if we were asked for the smallest of those set of atoms. Uh, when ranking ionic sizes, we have to think about comparing, um, in this case, apples to apples comparison would be the proton count. When I look at magnesium 2 plus, this atom here has 10 electrons, sodium has 10 electrons, fluoride has 10 electrons. So F has 9, add 1, gets to F minus, sodium has 11, take 1 away, it gets to 10. And so what we want to compare here is how many protons these atoms have because they're isoelectronic. We have equal number of negative particles. If I have more positive particles, I can pull those negative particles in more closely. And so magnesium 2 plus will be the smallest because it has 12 protons. And then sodium plus will be next. It has 11 protons to pull in those 10 electrons. And then F minus is next with nine protons. And so that first trend here of A is the right answer to this question. And so we have to think about comparing, if we're comparing sodium to fluorine without the charges, if I'm comparing just like Na versus F, where these are neutral and charged, then I'm picking my left to right trend. Here I'm thinking that left to right size decreases, fluorine's even smaller than chlorine, chlorine's smaller than sodium. So sodium definitely has to be bigger than fluorine without the charges. But then when you put the charges on the ion, all of a sudden sodium is smaller than fluoride once you go to their cation versus anions. So anions are bigger than their neutral counterparts, but cations are smaller than their neutral counterparts. This should make a ton of sense. If you take sodium, you're removing a whole shell, and you're making sodium a lot smaller as a result. Fluorine, you're adding all the electron repulsions by adding an extra electron, and so that increases the size. So here you're just seeing the increase in size versus the decrease in size, and then flips the trend.
Um, what's the proper general and trend for the first ionization energy from top to bottom? And so if we think from left to right first, like so the ionization energy from left to right is that one that kind of goes up, zigzags down a little bit, goes back up, zigzags down and goes back up. So we go two up, then we have one that's down, three elements up, one down, then the next three elements up. If we throw some examples in here, this might be like lithium, beryllium being on the first trend, and then um, boron's a little bit lower than you expect, and this is just because we're removing electrons from, instead of a 2s, a 2p subshell, we're not really getting a good apple-to-apple -apple comparison between the ionization energy. If you think of ionization energy as just the idea of the attractive nature of the electrons to the nucleus, we're just like not comparing apples to apples with ionization energy when the type of electron that we're removing um, um, from the atom is varying from left to right. And then we go to carbon, nitrogen, and then we get the oxygen. Now the issue with oxygen is it spin pairs an electron where boron, carbon, nitrogen didn't have a spin paired electron. So it makes it take a little less energy to remove a spin paired electron, but then fluorine neon continue the trend. So you get a general increase from left to right for the ionization energy, but we say there's a periodic inconsistency. And I think the thing worth highlighting is that the size trend doesn't have the same inconsistency because this is just a nuance of ionization energy of you know, an MP1 versus spin paired configuration that we don't see with size in a similar way. So size doesn't have this inconsistency and as well, the effective charge didn't have this inconsistency. And so then as we go from top to bottom, two things happen. Um, the, the size goes up, but then the charge goes up too. So when we're thinking of the energy of electrostatic attractive nature between those electrons, the outer electrons and their nucleus, which one of these terms wins out? So we're saying from top to bottom, the effective charge goes up a little bit, but then so too does the size of the atom. But we saw that it's generally the size of the atom that wins, and that's going to decrease the attractive nature of that electron and decrease the ionization energy. So we're going to see a slight decrease and that first ionization energy from top to bottom is our general trend. And so the um, IE1 tends to decrease from top to bottom because the atomic size decreases. Or, I'm sorry, that's not the right answer. The atomic size is increasing with the trend. So the I1 is uh, decreases because the uh, from top to bottom because the atomic size is increasing. Now, any instances, there are a few instances we pointed out where there is an increase in the ionization energy from top to bottom. And for those, you can reason that that's because the effective charge is increasing. So you might be looking at answer C and saying, well, doesn't the effective charge increase? But it usually just doesn't win out. So usually the trend that wins out is the atomic size, leading the IE to slightly decrease. And then if you do see the ionization energy increasing, you can probably explain that through, for those elements, that effective charge increase countered and was bigger than the size increase. So a little bit of an inconsistent trend, but if you go back to when we were looking at these trends, almost every group followed the trend, and there was only a few examples where we were seeing a break in this general decrease in ionization energy from left to right or from top to bottom. Uh, when we look at the configuration of cations, we just have to remember that for something like zinc, we did the configuration of zinc earlier. Let's start for all these atoms. You would want to start with the uncharged atoms configuration first. So zinc neutral would be argon, 4s2, 3d10. And the rule for cations out of chapter 7 for their electron configurations is you lose the electrons from the largest orbitals first. You take the electrons away from the highest n with the highest l. So you look for the highest n orbital, the highest shell, that's the biggest orbital. And then if you have two orbitals with the same n value, you take the highest l electrons away first. And so for zinc, it's going to lose the 4s2 electrons via 3d10. That has zero unpaired electrons. These are all spin paired. We have a completely filled 3D subshell. And so we get zero unpaired electrons for zinc. If I go to cobalt 2 plus, so cobalt neutral would be an argon 4s2 3D7, because it's the seventh across um, the, the D block there. So we're going to take away the 4s2 first again. So we're going to have a 3D7. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have three unpaired electrons for cobalt. Iron 2 plus just kicks one electron off. It's a 4s2, 3d6. So for iron, I'd have four unpaired electrons. Manganese 2 plus, so manganese neutral is an argon, 4s2, 3d5. So we get all five of those electrons unpaired when we remove the s electrons first. And then calcium, it's just zero unpaired electrons. It just has the argon configuration. So the most here is manganese 2 plus. 
Let's just do one other quick example for something like 10, just to make sure if we're doing 10 2 plus. This is where the highest end with the highest L comes into play. So 10's configuration, it's down to the next row. It's a Krypton uh, um, 5S2, 4D10, and then 5P2. If we were going back to the valence question, we'd say it has four valence electrons just like carbon has. The entire row of 10, like carbon, has four valence electrons. So we're not counting the 4D10 toward, toward the uh, valence. So 10 2 plus is gonna lose from the highest N, but with the highest L. So it's gonna lose the 5P2 first. So 10 2 plus should be Krypton 5S2 4D10. And if we go to 10 4 plus, then we're gonna lose the 5S2 next. So it would just be a 4D10 for 10 4 plus. So lattice energies, um, so lattice energies, we want smaller ions, or, smaller ions that have a greater attractive force. And so if I'm comparing sodium iodide, potassium iodide, lithium chloride, the smallest ions are lithium chloride. So they have the greatest attractive force, take the most energy to separate. So the greatest here should be lithium uh, chloride. So on this side, because that's our greatest side. And then sodium um, iodide. So iodide's, sodium's bigger than lithium, iodide's bigger than chloride, but then potassium's even bigger than sodium. So having larger ions weakens their electrostatic force of attraction, lowers their lattice energy. So decreasing lattice energy here would be E. And so again, it's that same kappa Q1, Q2, divided by D, energy of electrostatic attraction. Think of the magnitude of attractive force if the ions are closer together, we get a greater energy of electrostatic attraction. It takes more energy, therefore, to separate. If you have higher magnitudes of charge, this question doesn't look at this, but if you had two plus two minuses, greater lattice energy. Uh, sig fig question um, from chapter one, of course. And so we just have to think order of operations here. And so, um, so I have multiplication and division, and so all of this here, just for this step here, needs to go to two sig figs. Just from uh, multiplying and dividing, and anytime we multiply and divide, like we have the first number in parentheses, like we could do that first if you want, 7.045 times 0.545, that's 3.839. So this, if we did this as our only step, I'd call that 3.84. So if this step here, was the only step in the problem, we'd be rounding that to three sig figs. But then we need to divide that, and I'm keeping the whole number. So we generally just went around once in a problem. I'm gonna divide that by 0 0.0042, and then that only is good to two significant figures. That's why this whole step here for the first multiplication division step would only go to two sig figs. I get 914 and some change. So that would need to go to the tens placeholder. So this number here, again, if this is my only step in the problem, I'd report that as 910. Now, whether we round or keep the digit doesn't matter too much, but just remember this part here, when I'm adding the final step, what we just wanna do is make sure to line up our sig figs. And I have one to the tens, one to the ones placeholder, and this value here has to be rounded to the tens placeholder. So 914 plus 6044 should be rounded to 6960. So I get 6958. And so that should round to 6960 with three significant figures. And so I think the key reminder is you can't just look and see two sig figs here and say there's multiplication, I see two sig figs, that the whole problem rounds to two. Not necessarily. Just that part of the problem rounds to two, then we just have to apply the addition rule. Remember, whatever you're adding numbers, say you're adding 25.5 plus 2.57, it's all about where these values lie. We're gonna round this here to the tenths value. And if you have this, like imagine this is like 92.5, Five, seven, plus 25.5, that's gonna end up with four sig figs. So you gotta be careful. A lot of questions will ask how many sig figs, but line the, the numbers up, do the math, and then, so we get 117.07, that would round to 117.1 to four sig figs. So you can't just look three plus four sig figs round to three, you gotta like just do the math, write it out, look at it, 
and try not to make mistakes with the relatively straightforward sig fig questions that are just going to get at these little nuances of the rules and just trying to follow the multiplication rule when we multiply, the division rule when we divide, the addition and subtraction rule when we do those math steps. Now, okay, this question here, uh, which one represents a mixture of two different molecules? And so if we had just like this, this is an atom. If I have this here, this could represent a molecule. If I have this, this could also represent a molecule. Let's imagine them touching together. This could also represent a molecule. Because we could be thinking something like nitrous oxide, or we could be thinking something like O2 or N2. So both of those could be molecules. Now, O2 is not a compound. So like this one here is a compound. A compound has to have two elements. And so O2 is not a compound in terms of some of our kind of like lingo. And so then a mixture should just have two different types of things present. And so we should have two different types of uh, molecules present. And so box two looks like a box that has two different types of molecules present because I see something that might be O2, something that might be NO. So I see two different molecules in box two. Box four has two different atoms. So it has a mixture maybe of helium and neon, maybe something like that. So it's an atomic gas mixture, but those aren't molecules. I need the atoms to be stuck together. So these are atoms, not molecules, but it at least is a mixture. Um, three is, uh, just looks like a single molecule, not a mixture. Um, three could be a um, box that shows a compound, but not, um, but not a mixture. Um, so three, compound or molecule, or we could call it a molecular compound, of course. And then one is not a compound. So one would be, if, if it said, uh, which box contains an example of a molecule that's not a compound, then that would be box one. Uh, neutron count. Sometimes we forget all this like simple stuff. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully we stress what protons and why they matter. But uh, which atom has the most neutrons? And so an atom with a atomic number of 28 and a mass number of 59. So that would be nickel. And so nickel 28, 59. The difference would lead to the number of neutrons. So that would be 31 neutrons because the protons plus the neutrons are the mass number. So if you subtract, so, that, so the number of protons plus the number of neutrons is equal to the mass number. So 59 is mass number. Subtracting 28 would give us 31 neutrons. Manganese with a mass number of 55. Manganese is element number 25. So 25 protons. And that gives us 30 neutrons. Iron 56. So iron 56 is element 26. That's also 30 neutrons. Chromium 52. Mass number is 52. Chromium is element number 24. 28 neutrons. So the most number of neutrons here is answer A, that nickel atom with a mass number of 59. So again, remember, protons is the atomic number that the positive particles tell you what the atom is. And then that summed up with the neutrons gives you the mass number. And then, of course, the charge would be up here, but the electrons usually don't come into play with their mass number. They carry such a small amount of mass. That's why we're just calculating the difference of um, electrons versus the protons for the charge. Uh, the sum of all the natural occurring atomic weights is equal to the average atomic weight of the element. So the average atomic weight of a given element that we list in the periodic table is the sum of the atomic weight of each isotope times the fraction of that isotope summed over all isotopes. And this is a terrible John um, Sigma symbol for adding these all up. And so we can add up the abundances, that's even worse, um, of all the atomic weights of each isotope that an element exists at in a natural sample. But we're told here that iodine exists only as one isotope. And so since iodine is only one isotope, that means it's 100% whatever the mass is that's listed as its average atomic weight. So we go to the periodic table and look for iodine, and it's 126.9045. Or you know, with more digits, this number here. So answer C. It's not 127 exactly AMU. It's 126.90447. Couple naming questions. Um, I think I'll just name these without writing them, but potassium carbonate, not dipotassium carbonate, just potassium carbonate for A, sodium chlorate or chlorite. So CLO3 is chlorate. 
And so we lost an O down to two, that becomes ite. So that's chlorite. Iron three oxide, that's iron three plus. Oxide's a two minus, so that's Fe2O3. And magnesium sulfate is Mg2 plus is magnesium ion. Sulfate's a two minus, so that's just MgSO4. I think I'm out of time, but I'll throw the video up for the remaining problems. I have office hours after class till 1230. Again, two to three today and a bunch of hours tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, hey, I had a great time this semester. Hope you guys did too. Again, thanks again for attending class uh, throughout the semester. Good luck on all your finals and beyond. So.